I was hired to story edit Friday the 13th series, and our offices were at Paramount, and that was just when Star Trek The Next Generation was ramping up. So no one had seen their costumes, no one had seen what anyone looked like or, what, or knew what, what was going to be uh, coming down the pike. And I would have lunch at the restaurant, the executive restaurant at uh, Paramount, and the entire cast of Star Trek The Next Generation would, uh, would have lunch there at a big table. And two memories I have of that were I was waiting to be seated one time, and there was uh, someone with his back toward me waiting to be seated, and he was in a, a suit, a brown suit and a fedora, and he turned around and he had yellow eyes. And I jumped, and it was Brett Spiner, his data, in makeup, and he laughed. And uh, that's before data w had been on TV, had, it had been seen by the audience. And the other, the other memory I have of that is, um, uh, so all the Star Trek cast would sit at, at the table. And um, at one point, I was at another table, you know, and uh, uh, Jonathan Frakes, who played Riker, got up to, I guess, get the men's room or whatever. And being an actor, of course, he was very aware that everyone was looking at him. They, they were all in costume. They were all in their, in their you know, you know one-piece uh, jumpsuit, jumpsuits from season one. And I remember Frakes, he gets up and being an actor, he's noticing that everyone's looking at him. He's kind of preening and he walked right into a pillar, and <laughs> face first. <laughs> so so there, are, there are dangers to being an actor and it's, it's a very risky occupation. But, uh, but then, of course, at the moment Star Trek The Next Generation was announced, I was eager to write for it because, uh, because I'd grown up with Star Trek and one of the reasons I'd become a writer was Star Trek. I w in fact, I, I was given a Christmas present of a, of a trip to the original Star Trek set when they were shooting Turnabout Intruder. So, um, so I just pitched uh, to Star Trek as much as I possibly could. And, and for several years, every time I pitched to Star Trek, the producer that I pitched to would love one or more of my stories, be determined to buy it, and then get fired before he could. This happened with David Gerald, many, many other producers on the show, uh, Tracy Torme again and again. And um, so finally, I ended up pitching to Michael Piller, and, uh, it was, and it was fascinating because the trick with coming up with Star Trek ideas was to come up with something that they had never done before. That was the challenge, to find something meaningful and find sort of the hole in the mythos. And, and as Star Trek went on, between the original show and the movies and Next Gen and so forth, it was, it was very challenging to find something that was a, a hole in their mythology. So at one point I was pitching, and I remember it was 5 o'clock the day before Thanksgiving, and it was M Michael Piller and the entire writing staff, Ron Moore, Hans Beimler, everybody, everybody around the table, Ira Bear, and um, nobody wanted to be there. Nobody wanted to be there. They all wanted to go home and have their holiday. And I, and I was standing, and they were all sitting. I remember that. And I started pitching. And normally I would pitch the first two or three to any show, and I would sell something. And my storylines were very, very involved. And, for, and they, kept, they liked what I, was, what I was coming up with, but they kept saying, keep going, keep going. And so I would be, so it was first the, the, the very developed stories, then the paragraphs, then the, down the one-liners. And I was talking nonstop for an hour, and my body was an entire full-body cold sweat because I was just giving it my all. And I remember Ira Bear saying, this guy's an idea machine. We should just put him in a room and have him slip paper under the door, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so finally I got to one, and I never pitched my one-liners. I would generate about 100 ideas when I would go to pitch to a show, but I would never get past the first third, three or four. But in this case, I was just going and going and going and going. And uh, finally I said, okay, you've got the prime directive, and so you've done stories where the enterprise is interacting with, with um, cultures at their level of technology, because the prime directive allows them to be upfront about who they are and what they're doing to to cultures at their level. So you, but, and you've also got the prime directive where they c have to keep themselves secret from any culture below a certain level of technology. But you've never done a story where a, a planet reaches the level of technology where the prime directive shuts off and the enterprise is sent to make first contact. And their eyes all lit up. And they said, wow, that's great. And they said, well, we have to run it by the studio, but we really like that one. And in my memory, they called me the next day and said it had been approved, but it must have been after the Thanksgiving holiday. But as soon as they could possibly call me, they said, you've got a sale. And uh, that was the episode First Contact. And I was busy story editing shows and producing shows and doing a lot of stuff, so I ended up not writing that script. But, it, but the episode certainly came out very, very well. And the idea also, what I, what I said when I was pitching it was, the idea was, it's day the earth stood still, but it's told from the viewpoint of the alien culture where the Enterprise is the flying saucer that lands and our guys come out and say, there's a larger universe. And so the idea of flipping viewpoint was also a very strong idea uh, in that episode. And, uh, and so I was very proud to have cracked Star Trek The Next Generation. And then, of course, uh, a year or two later, 
I would uh, come up with Far Beyond the Stars for Deep Space Nine, of which I'm enormously proud. And that was another game changer. And so, <coughs> and so now I'm doing uh, Space Command with uh, a lot of the guys that I worked on uh, Next Gen with and DS9 with. So it's Armin Shimmerman and Doug Drexler and Mike Akuda and, uh, and Ethan Phillips from Star Trek Voyager. And so, so our, our love of Star Trek continues to, uh, and includes our love of science fiction and we're doing Space Command. And it's very much, I, one thing I can say for certain is if you like Star Trek, you're going to love Space Command. And uh, I can't wait to, uh, to show it to all of you and have you uh, be part of the journey.